Hi there, misfits. This is Kate. And this is Kevin. Welcome to Horrorwood. lot to discuss right here at the top right at the top a lot of business we have a huge announcement for all of you if you're not on our patreon then you probably don't know uh, because we did release it to patreon first but we're doing our very first live live show show. oh my goodness i'm so excited i'm kind of freaking out it's gonna be so much fun we Uh, need to figure out what we're gonna wear yes We'll talk. Are, are we going to wear Halloween costumes? Or are we, oh. we going to wear sequins and just feel fancy? I don't know. Oh, I, st- I have that nun costume. I have several capes. <laughs> <laughs> I, my uh, werewolf hands. Oh, my God. You're, you're set. <laughs> I'm ready. I got to figure out what I'm going to do. <laughs> it's going to be here in Chicago because that is where we're based. Yeah. And it's our first one. So we thought, let's just do it at home. Yeah, 100%. We're hoping, though, that it goes well, which means we could come to a city near you. Ooh, tour. We hope. We that's, hope. That's, that's the dream. That's the dream. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll see how it goes. So this one's going to be at the Venus Cabaret Theater on Southport Avenue on October 25th, 7.30 p.m. Spooky season. Be there or be somewhere else. Or be underground. Oh, shit. No, don't. They don't no, have to No, come to the show. It. No. <laughs> Tickets but it are will on... be to die for. <laughs> Tickets are on sale now. And where can they get those? They can get those at bit.ly slash horrorwood. So get those tickets. They're only 28, 28 little bucks. dollary dues, you guys. And we hope to see you there. Like I said, it's at a cabaret theater, which means it's kind of small, which means you should get your tickets now because hopefully it fills up fast. It fills up fast. <laughs> it's a beautiful venue, you guys. It's really nice neighborhood, really great drinks. Lots of restaurants around. Lots of really good restaurants. We're going to be playing a drinking game, so make sure you get those drinks at the bar when you come in. Yeah, we'll have some and giveaways. we do have some giveaways. So we promise it's going to be a fun time. Yeah. We're not going to tell you what the topic is. That's a surprise. But we're so excited. We want to get you guys excited. We hope that you come. If you're nearby in the Chicago area, we would love to see you. Don't worry, there's not going to be any audience participation. We're not those kind of people. We understand wanting to just sit and watch. Nobody <laughs> likes audience participation, but there is going to be a drinking game. and That's the extent of the participation. Yes. Yeah. We're not yeah. going to like ask Single you people questions or anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. no, 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 no. We aren't that people. No. So please, 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 hopefully, if you are around and want to see a live show, you'll come Come to see Horrorwood Live. It's going to be amazing. I'm so excited. So that's our big announcement. You're going to hear us talking a lot about it for the next few weeks. And now we have a few new Patronians to shout out. I just realized I don't have my notes up at all. So let me find those because I wrote their names down. First up, we have... Natalie Dixon, who's joining us from the UK. Natalie, hey girl. Thank you so much. And this is a UK story, actually, oh, that amazing. I have today. Next, we have Lily. Lily, thank you so much. Thank we you, truly Lily. appreciate your support. And then we have Christina, who wrote us and said that we're the first podcast she's ever listened to. Are you serious? Which That's amazing. I'm honored. Oh, well, we're very honored, Christina. We popped your podcast cherry oh, oh, oh. <laughs> a pop <laughs> there it goes but, but, but. i don't know why they made me think of instinct <laughs> and then lastly we have liberty lee one liberty of our new lee. accomplices welcome to the accomplice liberty oh. lee i hope that that is your real name even if it's not i love it regardless that's amazing it's that's a such a good name. name so thank you so much we really truly appreciate your support and for our new Misfit Murderinos, you did join in time to get the fall gift package, so it's coming your way. And now we're going to get into it, because it's kind of a a longer case, and it's also a really, just really sad one. So okay. we, we got a little fun in the beginning, but now it's time to bring it down. Okay. In 2007, casting got underway 
for Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince, which was the sixth installment in the Harry Potter franchise. Were you a Harry Potter fan? Yes. Same. Love yes. it. Read all the books, watched all the movies. I read, so I was a little bit late to the game sure. when these came out. But once I got started on the books, I think the first four had come out already. Okay. I got them, I read them, I was obsessed, and then I waited for book six, you know, book five, book six, and seven. Mm-hmm. But by the time seven came out, I wasn't super into it oh, anymore. Oh, you were done. So I, I never read the last book. You don't know what happens? Did you watch the movies? I did watch the two movies uh, that they did out of the, uh, the last book. Yeah, because they split it. But I didn't, I wasn't super paying attention. I... <laughs> Wow. So not really. Okay. Interesting. Um, I was living in London when oh, the first Harry Potter film had its premiere. Whoa. Did you go? Well, I didn't go. I had some friends that went down there just to kind of like see what they could see, you know? Sure. And it was interesting because no one at the time knew what a phenomenon this was going to turn into, into be. Yeah. I imagine if you were a child living in the UK, even getting a part as an extra was a dream come true. Absolutely. Have you seen the clip of Margot Robbie talking about her husband being one of the extras in the Harry Potter films? No. Okay. So she's a huge Harry Potter fan. Oh, I didn't know that. Like, lifelong. I do too. Loves Harry Potter, like, geeks out over it. Huge, huge nerd fan for Harry Potter. Amazing. And it wasn't until after she had gotten married that she found out her husband was an extra in one of the films. I want to say it was The Prisoner of, A- the Prisoner of Azkaban. Oh, okay. And when she found this out, she freaked out. She was like, oh, my God, if I'd known sooner, we would have been married so fast. Just, just on the <laughs> spot. By the time Half-Blood Prince rolled around, the Harry Potter films had already secured their place in cinematic history. Oh, yeah. I remember taking, I'm sorry to cut you off. I took a bus from school with a whole bunch of other Harry Potter fans to the mall to see the first movie. Amazing. (laughs) These films employed literally thousands of people. And 18-year-old Rob Knox hoped to be one of them. Rob already had a few acting credits under his belt, but this was Harry Potter. This was huge. Yeah. So you can imagine his excitement when he was given the chance to audition. The casting process was a long one. They're not just handing out those roles willy-nilly. No, not at all. You get to be in Harry Potter and you get to be in Harry (laughs) Potter. It's an Oprah special. (laughs) No, it took weeks, if not months. There were several callbacks, so Rob had to keep going in to read for the part. Sure. He was originally up for the role of McLaggen. He actually read for a couple of roles, Mm -hmm. so they kept bringing him in like, Okay, you can read this for us. Okay, try it this way. All right, thanks. And then he'd wait and wait. And they'd call and say, okay, now we'd like you to come in and read for this role instead. So he'd prep the scene. He'd go in. They'd say, that was great. Now try it this way. Okay, thanks. Oh, God, the cycle. Rob's mom, Sally, said that during the audition process, she felt sick because she knew how bad he wanted a role in the film, and she knew how disappointed he would be if he didn't get it. Yeah. Especially when he's going in so many times. I mean, when they keep bringing you back, it gives you a lot of hope. Sure. Yeah. The film's director, David Yates, said, quote, I remember Rob distinctly because he was a confident, charming, very likable guy and was clearly nervous but had huge belief in his own abilities. Good. After multiple rounds of auditions, director David Yates and casting director Fiona Weir ultimately decided not to cast Rob as McClagan. Son of a fuck. Instead, oh. they felt he would be perfect for the role of Marcus Belby. Oh, yay! <laughs> the character Marcus Belby is a Ravenclaw student whose most notable trait is that he is the nephew of the inventor of Wolfsbane Potion. Wolfsbane. Kate, what's your house? I, what was my house when I did that little thing? I almost want to say you would be a Gryffindor or a Ravenclaw, maybe. I think I, I think I'm a combination of the two. Okay. Because I always got Gryffindor, Mm -hmm. but I always wanted Hufflepuff. Oh, I can see you as a Hufflepuff. I say, I'm thinking Hufflepuff later in life. Yeah, I think so. (laughs) Later later in life, Hufflepuff. That's That's my drag name. Yeah. (laughs) Wolfsbane Potion is used to treat the effects of 
turning into a werewolf. I hate when that happens. Don't you? You should get some potion. What if I had werewolf hands right now when I can? You're like, oh. Here it goes. Here it goes. <laughs> <laughs> Rob was absolutely ecstatic. This was a huge opportunity. He got to be in a scene with the incredible Jim Broadbent, along with the film stars Daniel Radcliffe and Emma Watson. Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince came out in 2009. But sadly, Rob didn't get to see himself in it. No. Which one was Half-Blood Prince? Is that the fifth one? Sixth. Sixth. I'm sorry. Okay. Rob didn't get to see himself in it because in May of 2008, just a few days after filming wrapped, 18-year-old Rob Knox was murdered. No. So let's learn more about Rob. Okay. Robert Arthur Knox was born on August 21st, 1989 in Kent, England, about an hour from the center of London. He was the oldest child of Sally and Colin Knox, followed by his younger brother, Jamie. Rob and Jamie were only about a year apart, and not only were they close in age, but they had a really close relationship as well. In the documentary, Knox, the Rob Knox story, which is excellent, by Ooh, the way. Where and is it on? So you can find it uh, on Roku, and I'm going to link it in the oh, show cool. notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jamie said that, of course, they had their typical sibling arguments, but they were also best friends. And that's not just a brother saying that because his brother has died. Like, oh, he was my best friend. They were really, like, close. Okay. According to everyone, family members, friends, Rob and Jamie were inseparable. Wow. Whenever Rob went out, he invited Jamie. They had the same group of friends. So... They were always together. That's amazing. And they had the same interests. Both were natural performers. When they were little, they loved putting on shows for their family. They would do magic shows and fashion shows and act out little skits. They loved dressing up. They loved entertaining. I remember being in the basement of my childhood home and like wearing some of my mom's old clothes and pretending I was like a business person <laughs> in heels it. in second grade and I eating like it. whatchamacallits. I loved Whatchamacallits. Whatchamacallits to this day are one of my favorite candy bars. Oh my God. I haven't had one in years. They still make them. I know they do. <laughs> I just haven't had one. Rob's mom, Sally, said that he was always a good kid and loved playing jokes. He was always full of mischief. Ugh. She recalls one time when she was outside of their house in the garden, and similar to Kevin, all of a sudden, Rob walks out dressed in his dad's clothes. So, like, a suit that was way too big, an overcoat that dragged along the ground, a tie that wasn't tied because he didn't know how. And he says, all right, I'm off to work. And then he just goes <laughs> on his way. I love that. His mom said he loved pretending he was some other character. So it's really not surprising that he pursued acting. Sure. You can definitely see that was a natural path for him to mm -hmm. want to take. Despite being really outgoing and playful, he was not spared the bullying that so many kids go through. Yeah. When he began secondary school, which from what I understand, secondary school in the UK is like our middle and high school yeah. combined. It's ages 11 to 16. When he began going to secondary school, a group of 10 boys began bullying him. They picked on him because he was overweight. He was around 11 years old when the bullying started, and it went on for three years. No. Rob said, quote, the bullying got so bad, I dreaded going into school. They used to push me and beat me up in the corridor or outside on the school grounds. I started really hating myself. I didn't like what I saw. This makes me sad. I relate 100%. It breaks my heart. Yeah. People, they, kids and teens are relentless. They're mean. They're, They're so mean, mean. little motherfuckers. Wow. Rob said the experience taught him the importance of standing up to bullies. Good. And he managed to use humor to cope with the harassment and abuse. Okay. His mom, Sally, said that when he was getting bullied, that's when his personality really started to come out. Not just at home where he'd always been an entertainer, but he became a class clown at school, always joking around. See, that's the defense mechanism. It is. If you can't, you know, you, you try to find a way out of it by making fun of it. I get 100% understand that. Yeah, he, he becomes the class clown. He was always laughing. Sally said he was probably a teacher's nightmare because he just wanted to make the other kids laugh. Yeah. But one of his teachers commented that Rob was always polite and very cheeky. He had a smile for everyone. And you just don't hear that often when it comes to bullying, I feel, because usually 
usually I feel like you hear it taking a tragic turn yeah. or uh, kids don't have the the tools to cope with it. Exactly. And that's not to say that Rob was unscathed by it all, but I just mean it sounds like he found the healthiest way he could to combat all the negativity he was facing. 100%. Because of all the bullying, halfway through secondary school, Rob decided to switch schools and began going to the same one that his younger brother Jamie was attending, okay. which was Beth's Grammar School, or just Beth's. It sounds like this was a much better situation. And Good. the brothers liked being at the same school. Jamie said, quote, I had someone to keep me safe. Uh, yeah, because they're so close. I'm sure yeah. it was nice to have that connection there. Absolutely. Because Rob certainly wasn't going to let anyone do to Jamie what had been done to him. No. In 2004, Rob was quoted in a newspaper about the bullying he'd uh -huh. experienced and its effects on him. And by then he was already going to Beth's. And he said, quote, I'm totally different now. I used to be so unconfident because of my weight and the bullying, but nothing gets to me now. Good. Yay. And that was genuine. Like, you see it through the rest of his life. He was just full of confidence and just comfortable in his own skin. So he's come out the other side of it all. He's really popular at Beth's. He's got a large circle of friends and was known in the group as the organizer. As in, he's the one planning what they were all going to do that weekend Everyone went to Rob to find out where the party was. Like, he was that friend. Mm. Aaron Truss, the director of the documentary I mentioned, was one of Rob's closest friends. He said, quote, Rob was a lot of fun to be around. There was something about Rob that made you want to stick with him. I can't really put my finger on it, but he was very different than other children. His friends and family said he was a big teddy bear. As a teen, he was about six feet tall. Damn. He loved sports, particularly martial arts and rugby, and he would go on to play for the Sid Cup Rugby Club. But his first passion was performing. Performing. And his little brother, Jamie, had the same interest. So they both jumped at the opportunity when a cousin of theirs suggested they try out for the D&B Academy of Performing Arts, which was a training center that specialized in musical theater. A lot of their alumni go on to perform in the West End and in huge international tours, and they can help with getting an agent. That's amazing. Yeah. Since Is d and in Kent? I think so because they were from Kent. So I think so. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Since their cousin was already a student there, she was like, you guys should obviously come here. It's right up your alley. Donna Sullivan, who worked at DMB and would eventually become Rob's agent, hey, hey, said she remembered when she first met Rob and Jamie. They were really talkative and super confident, just two charming, outgoing kids. Lovely. They both started taking classes at the academy, but whereas Jamie was into the dancing and the musical theaterness of it okay, all, okay. that wasn't really Rob's thing. Okay, he wanted enough. to focus on acting. Yes. So he started looking in the newspaper each week for audition notices, and one day he came across one for a reality show called Trust Me, I'm a Teenager. What was that? <laughs> the premise of this show is that there are three families struggling with their kids' behavior. And three teenagers are chosen to observe the families and then give their suggestions on how to improve the situation in each household. It's like that show Super Nanny. With, Super Nanny. With, it's like that, but with teenagers. Okay. Ooh, that's weird. I don't know if I want to <laughs> listen to teenagers giving advice about so, parenting. Like, one family's dealing with kids that are out of control, and the teens observe that the family never eats their meals together. Everyone just takes their food and goes off on their own. Okay. So the teenagers suggest having at least two meals together every week, and they tell the mom, who is always smoking at the dinner table, that if she needs to smoke to go outside, away from the food— Sorry, Frankie is barking. That's okay. That if she needs to smoke to go outside away from the food because her kids don't like having smoke blown in their faces while they're eating, which is fair. Yeah. I don't like it either. Rob was one of the teenagers chosen to oh observe the families and make <laughs> suggestions. He was 13 at the That's time. That's insane. I love it. He managed to get himself a couple of gigs that way, just looking through the newspaper. Yeah. And he worked as an extra in various productions as well, often with his brother, Jamie. Okay. As I mentioned earlier, he did eventually get an agent, Donna Sullivan. And so once he had representation, naturally his auditions got a little better. In 2007, he was cast in the role of Josh on the British TV series After You've Gone. He appeared in an episode in season one, and then they brought him back for an episode in season two. 
And this show was the first time his family and friends got to see him on TV in a scripted show as a character. It starred Nicholas Lindhurst, who is a big time British actor. So everyone was really excited. This was a huge opportunity. Cool. But an even bigger opportunity came that very same year when Rob was invited to audition for Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. I'm so excited for him. I love it. Which, knowing that he really only had a few small credits under his belt, makes it all the more impressive that he landed a speaking role in this iconic franchise. That's so quick. Yeah. That's like really fast for him. So kudos, because that does not happen for a lot of people. No, because his brother Jamie was also invited to audition. He read for the role of Tom Riddle. What the fuck? But he didn't get far in the process. I'm not even sure he got one call back. Oh, well, at least he got to audition. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Thanks, Donna. (laughs) Jamie said he was so jealous of Rob when he got Harry Potter, but at the same time, really happy for him. Oh, I'm glad. He said, quote, it was amazing. Good. I do think it'd be hard if both you and your brother auditioned for this massive franchise and he gets it and you don't. But I also think Jamie looked up to Rob so much that he really was fine with him getting it. Well, and also Jamie's, you know, you said Jamie was more into the musical dancing theater side of things, right? I mean, I don't think he would turn down okay, a that, role sorry, with Harry that's Potter. True. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> but he did work as an extra on it. So he got to hey, be a part of it in, in a small it? way. Yeah. On the set of Half-Blood Prince, Rob was known as a jokester. Of course, that was his personality. He took a lot of behind-the-scenes videos on his phone, which you can see in the documentary, just of him and other cast members hanging out when they weren't filming. And Tom Felton, who played Draco Malfoy, said, quote, The atmosphere on Half-Blood Prince was always playful. Filming took a long time, so in between, we would muck about. I remember Rob being quite the joker, quite cheeky. I love the term cheeky. Cheeky. I'm going to start saying it. Let's bring it out. (laughs) Felton said they stole Robbie Coltrane's phone. (gasps) Robbie Coltrane played Hagrid, RIP. And they tried turning the language on it into Turkish. (laughs) Unclear if they were successful, but they were always playing around and being mischievous. Felton said, quote, I remember it being equally fun on set with Rob as it was off. In Rob's scene in the film, his character Marcus has been invited to Professor Slughorn's Supper. Slughorn is played by Jim Broadbent. Mm -hmm. And Rob essentially has to continuously eat a bowl of pudding throughout the scene. Yum. Even while he's delivering his lines. And Broadbent pulled him aside before they started shooting and he's like, hey, pace yourself with the pudding because we'll probably be doing a lot of takes. And Rob's like, yeah, cool, cool, cool. Pace myself. Yep, got it. But once those cameras started rolling, he went hard on that pudding. Just he is shoveling it shove in. Shove it down. Which honestly is really what the scene needs. And Broadbent said, luckily for the humor in the scene, he ignored my advice completely. The character of Marcus Belby does not appear in the book The Deathly Hallows, which is the final installment of the Harry Potter series. But director David Yates was so pleased with Rob, not just of his performance, but how he conducted himself on set, that he decided he wanted to bring him back for Deathly Hallows. That's lovely. Oh, I'm so happy for him. As soon as he finished his work on Half-Blood Prince, Rob jumped into another film project. (gasps) This one was for his friend Aaron Truss. It was a 48-hour film project Aaron had to do for school. Did you ever do a 48-hour film project? No. What is that? Oh, my God. Okay. So I did one in L.A., You have literally 48 hours to write, cast, shoot, edit, like to make a movie, essentially. A full one? It's intense. They're usually like 10 minutes long. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. Aaron's film was called Employee of the Dead. Their friend group was obsessed with Shaun of the Dead at the time. Oh, that movie's so good. So they shot it in a Sainsbury's grocery store. Sainsbury's. I miss Sainsbury's. Oh, me too. That was my go-to store until I started going to Morrison's. I don't even remember Morrison's, but anyway. So they shot it in a Sainsbury grocery store, but of course they couldn't film during the day when actual shoppers were there. So they had to start shooting once the store closed, work all through the night, and then finish by 7 a.m. the next morning. And when Aaron asked Rob, hey, can you do this overnight thing? Rob was like, of course, I'll be there. It was Aaron, Rob, and their friends Todd and Joe. Rob played the store manager, Mr. Rose, Mm. who eats some contaminated beef and it turns him into a zombie. (laughs) Girl. Stay away from that beef. Don't eat the beef. Joe said, quote, in walks Rob. 
there was just sort of a way he walked into a room. He kind of just filled up the space. It was a confidence. There was this illumination. I don't think I can stress enough how much people thought of him. Like you really get a sense of it in this documentary. And again, I'll link it. They show a lot of pictures and they show a lot of behind the scenes footage, both of Employee of the Dead and of Harry Potter and cast members. There's several cast members that talk about him. And they all say the same thing. Like he was just fun. He was just a jokester, super confident, wanted to do a good job. Just like the friend you wanted to turn to. Yeah. Oh, he sounds nice. So they do this wild, intense, but super fun film shoot in the middle of the night. And after they finished Rob's last scene, they yell cut and Rob jumps up and he's like, all right, got to go, guys. My brother's waiting in the car. He didn't even wash off his makeup. He's got like fake blood dripping down (sighs) his face because he was he turned into a zombie. Oh, he was a zombie. And he just says bye. And Joe said it was just one of them normal. You don't even think about it. He sure. came around and said bye, and we looked up like, oh, yeah, see you later, mate. Thanks. And that was the last time they ever saw their friend alive. No, Kate. On or around May 16th of 2008, Rob and some friends were having drinks down at the Metro Bar, which was a favorite hangout for them. And remember, this is the UK where the drinking age is 18. Rob was 18, so he was of legal age to drink. Jamie, who was not 18 yet, would often join him. He would just use a fake ID. Mm -hmm. But he wasn't there on this particular night. I remember, like, I when I first studied abroad there, Mm -hmm. I was not 21. So it was cool to, like, be able to, to drink. Oh, so when I first, when I studied abroad there... I also was not 21, Mm -hmm. but when they made my ID, they got my birth year wrong. I I was 20, and it said that I was 21, so that when I got back to the States (gasps) and I was still 20... I had an ID that said I was 21, and I felt so amazing. Because it was my picture. Like, it was a real ID. So I was like, it's not even a fake ID. This is it. This is my real one. I'm 21. That's fantastic. It was great. I never, I didn't really know, like, how to drink. You know what I mean? Like, how much is too much, whatever, and whatever. But I would, like, go to the little bodega corner store and buy, like, a couple cans of Strongbow cider. And, like, some, some Indian samosas. Yes. And I would just sit up in my dorm room and I watch love it. YouTube. I thought you were going to say, and watch MTV. No. My <laughs> that MTV was a different days episode. Were over. That was a different episode. You'll hear more about this next, next week. week. <laughs> uh, so Rob is at the Metro. He's having a good time when a man that Rob didn't know walks up to him and just accuses him and his friends of stealing his phone. And Rob's like, we don't have your phone. Why would we take your phone? But this guy persisted. He couldn't find his phone. It was missing. And he made it up in his mind that Rob had taken it. He tried to search Rob's pockets and Rob refused. Then this guy just punches Rob's friend Dean. No. Out of nowhere, unprovoked. In a BBC News article about this, it says that after the guy punched Dean, quote, the group retaliated. So I take that to mean one or more of them threw a punch or threatened to, but they don't elaborate on what actually happened. This guy was reportedly humiliated and ran away. Good. So the friends were like, what's up with that guy? Bye, bitch. Maybe he had one too many, but they didn't give it much thought after that because he left and they just got back to their night. But after a while... This guy comes back holding a piece of wood and demanding a fight. What? It doesn't sound like there was a fight. Rob and his friends were just like, get the fuck out of here. The fact that Rob and his friends had stood up to him and Rob refused to let him search his pockets made this guy furious. So he turned to leave, but not before saying to them, quote, I'm going to come back next week and someone's going to die. Rob and his friends let it go. They chalked it up to, oh, that guy's just drunk. He'll probably find his phone in his own pocket later. Like, whatever. They put it out of their heads. I don't think Rob felt any true threat at the time. Because if he had, I think he would have taken action, maybe called the police. Well, this is a a bar, right? Mm -hmm. Like, where's management? Where's security? It's a very crowded bar. It's really busy. It's a Friday night. So I don't even think any of the employees saw what happened. Yeah. Okay. But Rob could take care of himself, and I do think that 
you know, if he had felt there was an issue, he would have taken action because sometime prior to this incident, Rob, along with four other men, was working his day job at a retail store called Marks and Spencer. <gasps> Marks and Spencer. When he witnessed two men assaulting someone. Rob and his co-workers were able to take the men down and hold them until police arrived. Oh my God. The two men were then arrested and convicted for causing grievous bodily harm. Wow. The Kent police gave Rob an award for bravery and outstanding professional conduct, which he was scheduled to accept in June. Rob was not afraid to stand up for people, but only took physical action if he felt it absolutely necessary. necessary. Yeah. And I don't think he gave the guy at the pub a second thought, probably just figured he was drunk. But this guy wasn't just another drunk guy at a bar. This was 21-year-old Carl Bishop, and he was no stranger to police. Bishop describes himself as having been an angry child. He hadn't seen or heard from his dad since he was about five years old, and he and his younger brother Grant were raised by their mother. While attending Red Hill Primary School... He was expelled and required to see a psychologist for anger management. Primary school is ages 4 to 11. So he had some deep issues to get expelled at that young of an age. And then to have to go to anger management. Oh, my God. By age 14, he already had convictions for criminal damage and theft. And by age 15, he had dropped out of school. At age 16, he was accused of pulling a knife on a man named James O'Doherty near a bus stop, saying, quote, go on, hit me now, and you'll get stabbed up. A few months later, the charge was dropped for whatever reason, but a few months after that, James and another man, Ian Sutherland, noticed Bishop and two of his friends harassing a woman. James and Ian tried to intervene, at which point Bishop stabbed them both, slashing them across their faces. Oh, my God. Bishop was charged with wounding with intent and assault causing actual bodily harm, to which he pleaded guilty. Yeah. He was sentenced to four years in prison, but was released early after serving just two years, getting out in March of 2007. Why? It doesn't say. That's okay. No, I just was figuring, well, like, was he well behaved? Or I don't something? think so. No. <laughs> but it doesn't say. Okay. He went to work for an air conditioning company after his release, but was laid off. Uh-huh. Then he worked as a window cleaner, but that didn't last long either. Oh. He said he spent most of his time getting drunk and smoking pot. Aye. Then in March of 2008, Carl Bishop was named as a suspect twice within two days. For two different incidents, first for an alleged burglary and then for a robbery committed at knife point. But for some reason, the officers investigating those claims never even bothered to question Bishop. What the fuck? Why not? A man who just served prison time for a knife crime, a man known in the area as, quote, a habitual knife carrier with a long record. They fucked up. Yeah. The victims literally said, Carl Bishop did this. And the officers just went, huh. Hmm. They never spoke to him. That's, that is beyond messed up. Those claims were still under investigation two months later on the evening of Friday, May 23rd, 2008, when Rob Knox and his friends went to the Metro Bar to celebrate him finishing filming on Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. It had been a week since Bishop had accused him of stealing his phone, something Rob had put out of his mind. His mom, Sally, said he was really looking forward to going out that night. Mm. And as he left the house, she said, please be back by midnight. Rob hurried out and didn't even say goodbye because he was so excited to meet up with his friends and tell them all about his time on the Harry Potter set. That's awesome. Because he literally had just finished filming. Yeah. I'm sure he couldn't wait to show them the videos he'd taken of him playing games in the parking lot with Draco Malfoy and Neville Longbottom. Uh And Sally didn't think anything about him hurrying out. This was routine. Sure. He went to the Metro Bar practically every week. But looking back, she said, quote, How I wish Robert had popped his head around the door to say goodbye. If only I could turn back the clock, give him one more hug, take one more look at his face, tell him how much I love him. But this was something, like I said, that he did every week. She's not thinking that. So she just said, please be back by midnight. Yeah. Down at the Metro Bar, the place was packed. 
It was lively. Rob and his friends are having a great time. And Rob's like, I want my brother here. So he gives Jamie a call. Originally, Jamie didn't want to go out that night. He said it was always a hassle dealing with a fake ID to try to get in. And he just wasn't up for it that night. But Rob said, oh, come down to the Metro. I want you here. It's a great night. Yeah. So Jamie went. Okay. The bar was really busy that night. Lots of people. Rob and Jamie and their friends were all having a drink. And then after a while, Jamie left with his friend Callum while Rob stayed to hang out with his friends. When Jamie walked outside, he noticed a guy he'd never seen before shouting at some girls and harassing them. The guy was Carl Bishop. Ugh, Bishop. And one of these girls was 18-year-old Karen Jones. Karen would later testify that Bishop kept demanding she kiss him, and she kept telling him no, but he wouldn't leave her alone. Psycho. She said, quote, I gave him a peck on the cheek so he would leave me alone, but he said, I want more than that. No. Carl? Carl. He then grabbed her by the arm and tried to drag her away from the bar, but she held on to her friend Alice's hand. Oh, my God. This is a girl, like, literally being dragged away, and she's oh just God. trying to hold on so that he can't take her. That's disgusting. She said, quote, he was quite drunk. He couldn't stand up straight. He was stumbling. That's when one of Jamie's friends stepped in to intervene mm-hmm. and got into a bit of a scuffle with Bishop, at which point... Bishop and the friends he was with left. Jamie said he didn't think anything of it. That was the end of that. He and Callum walked the block or so to Callum's car, and as they did, they ran into their friend Nick Jones, another friend of Rob's. Okay. And he was heading toward the Metro Bar. He was just coming out for going the night. In, yeah. And they were like, hey, how's it going? Have a great night, all that. And Jamie and Callum didn't get into Callum's car. Got it. Nick spots another couple of friends who had just left the bar, and they stop and chat for a minute. And as they did, Nick sees a man, Bishop, Bishop. over their shoulder, and he's carrying a knife. No. And Nick said to his friends, watch out, boys. That boy's got a knife. Bishop overheard him and starts coming towards him. Nick's friends stepped away, but Nick was frozen in place. He said he literally could not move. Bishop said to him, what are you saying? And Nick replied, I'm not saying anything. And then Bishop put the knife up to Nick's neck. Jamie and Callum are seeing all this from the car, and they're like, what the fuck? That's terrifying. So they drive towards them and up onto the curb a little bit, like right next to Bishop, hoping that's going to distract him. And he'll just like move along. along. Yeah. Yeah. Nick said that the fact that a car had just driven up onto the curb did not phase Bishop at all. He just went up to the window and said to Jamie and Callum, you fucking want some? And they're all just sort of stunned. Like, what is happening here? Who is this guy? Bishop then walks around the car and says to them, you're lucky. It's not your night to die. Yuck. Then he walked away, heading in the direction of the Metro bar. Jamie immediately called Rob and told him he just had this run in with a guy with a knife and said, he's headed for the bar. Get out of the way or just leave. Once Bishop left that air, like left the group to to go towards the bar, Nick called the police and described him perfectly what he was wearing, where he was going, that he had a knife. He said, you need to get a police car down here now. But Bishop had already reached the bar and Nick knew the police weren't going to get there in time. So Nick put down the phone and ran towards the bar. Jamie got out of the car shouting, he's got a knife, he's got a knife. But it was so loud and busy and there were a lot of people leaving the bar, a lot of people arriving. So no one really heard him. This is insane to me that like there are just so many people around. Yep. And this just shit like this just happens. Mm -hmm. By now, Rob and his friends had come outside because Rob was like, no one threatens my brother or my friends with a knife. And people outside are starting to realize this is a dangerous situation. The bouncers see what's going on outside, so they lock the doors that Bishop can't get in. Good. But they also don't do anything to help or intervene. They just stay inside. Like, what? So we've got Bishop outside with a knife, and now there are several young people, all late teens, early 20s, forming a semicircle around him. Everyone is shouting. Rob shouts, why'd you pull a knife on my brother? 
Bishop shouts, who's going to make my fucking day? Jamie said Bishop had a look in his eyes like he was possessed. Yeah, it's that it's that killer black eyes look. Rob's friend Andrew Dormer was standing a little to the side of Bishop and attempted to tackle him to the ground. That's when Bishop stabbed him in the chest. Andrew said he remembers screaming and getting really dizzy and he kept slipping in and out of consciousness. Uh. The next thing he knew, he was waking up in an ambulance with his shirt ripped off and blood pouring out of his chest. Oh, yikes. After seeing Andrew get stabbed, Nick manages to grab Bishop's hand that was holding the knife. And he was like, this ends now. But what Nick didn't know is that Bishop didn't have just one knife. He had multiple knives. He had two. They measured 11 and 12 inches long. Holy shit. Those are big knives. They're huge. Bishop then uses his free hand, the one not in Nick's grasp, yeah. and stabs Nick. No. Nick saw the knife coming toward him and put his hand up to shield his face. Ah. And he watched as the knife went through the palm of his hand ah. and out the other side. No, 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 no. Okay, I'm not a fan of stabbings. Is anyone a fan of stabbings? No, I don't mean to say it like that. I mean, they just make me, like, queasy. Yes. After Andrew and Nick were stabbed... Four more were attacked. It's unclear the order, but Rob's friend Charlie Grimley was stabbed in the face and arm. Tom Hopkins was stabbed in the leg, I believe, and Dean Saunders. He was the same guy with Rob the week before when Bishop was hounding them about his phone. phone, Dean was the one Bishop had punched the week before. Dean was stabbed in the neck (gasps) and suffered permanent spinal damage. He spent weeks in the hospital and had to relearn how to walk. And that brings us to Rob. At this point, Jamie had turned away from the attacks screaming because he just he didn't know what to do. And he's just screaming. And when he turned back around, he saw his brother with both arms around a bishop. People described it as a rugby move the way he was holding him, like he had rugby attacked him. So with Rob restraining him, at this point, Jamie and several others rushed over and took Bishop down. But when Jamie turned back to Rob, Rob said, I've been stabbed. Help me. Callum led him over to an area that was off to the side a little bit and Mm -hmm. helped him to lay down on the ground. And Jamie didn't know what to do. He wasn't sure how serious it was. And he thought, should I call mom? Oh, it's late. I don't want to wake her. No, I should call her. Like, he's not thinking, my brother's about to die. He's thinking, do I worry mom? Does she really need to come down here? But he called her. And when Sally arrived on the scene, paramedics were working to try and resuscitate Rob. Jamie said he knew then that Rob was probably already dead. Rob was stabbed a total of five times. Once in the buttock and four times in the chest. (sighs) One of the stab wounds to the chest severed a major artery, and he died from internal bleeding. The time it took for Bishop to stab Andrew in the chest, Nick in the hand, Dean in the neck, Charlie in the face and arm, Tom in the leg, and Rob in the buttock and chest was 90 seconds. What the fuck? It was so quick. That is so fast. Rob was taken to Queen Mary's hospital, and Sally called Rob's dad, Colin. Colin and Sally had separated some time prior. Sure. But it sounds like they were all still on In good contact. terms. Yes. Yeah. And so she calls him. They get down there. They had to wait almost an hour to find out if Rob was going to make it. But he was pronounced dead around 1 a.m. on Saturday, May 24th. The other stabbing victims were also at the hospital being, being treated for their injuries As was Carl Bishop, he'd been taken in an ambulance to be checked out, and they took him to the same hospital as his victims. That's madness to me. I mean, I guess it was the closest one, but when I read that, I was like, I'm sorry, what? I'm so angry. Karen Jones, the young woman that Bishop had been harassing earlier in the night, waited at the hospital with Charlie Grimley. They were friends. Okay. Charlie was the one stabbed in the face and arm. Okay. And she saw Bishop sitting in the back of an ambulance laughing. When police constable Craig Reed told Bishop that Rob had died from the stab wounds and he was being charged with murder, Bishop said, sweet. Reed said, 
there was no real reaction. But when Bishop realized he was going to miss a boxing match he had wanted to watch, that's when he got mad. Bishop told the officer that he didn't care if he was going to prison, stating, quote, this is, these are his exact words. I get gym every day, meals, take me there. And then just for the icing on the cake, he added, when I get out, I'm going to rape your mom. I need to come down for a second. Sure. Let me just take a breath, take yeah, a beat. Yeah, do it. I'll have a sip of water. Death to Carl Bishop. Does he die? Is he in prison? I'm sure we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. That's an evil person. He, That's an like, evil, evil person. He doesn't even care. He doesn't give a shit. And that's a fucking psycho, socio, whatever the fuck you want to call it. Get it off the street. It's not a person. It's a killer. Bishop pleaded not guilty. Fucker, fuck, fuck. Which is wild considering he was arrested at the scene and was the only one with knives in his possession. But he was trying to claim it was self-defense. Bishop's trial was held at the Old Bailey in London in February of 2009. When he walked into the courtroom, he smiled at some friends of his that had shown up to support him. You really got to ask yourself why you're supporting a murderer. I don't, I don't quite understand. Jamie, Nick, Karen, along with the other victims of Bishop, were called to the stand. Bishop just kept a smirk on his face the whole time, while his lawyer, Ian Bourne, tried to make the victims look like the guilty ones. Because, of course, that's what they're going to try to do. And it was a harsh realization for all of them that, oh, we're not just here to give a statement. Like, they're going to try to wear us down and poke holes in our story. Like, we're the ones on trial here. The fact that Jamie and Callum had driven up on that curb that night, Bourne tried to insinuate that they were trying to run Bishop over. Which they weren't at all, of course. Then Bourne claimed Rob had smashed a bottle over Bishop's head, which also never happened. There were plenty of witnesses. Rob's friend Tarek Osris Baraglu, I'm I don't know if I'm saying that right, had heard enough and was livid that this attorney would try to make it sound like Rob was the attacker. And he said, quote, he went over there like a man with nothing in his hand, not with knives, speaking about Rob. Mm-hmm. Then he pointed at Bishop and said, he did everything. Everyone that got stabbed, he did it. Then Tarek turned to Bourne, the attorney, and said, I don't know how you can defend him, a criminal. I'd rather be a dustman than do what you do. A dustman is a garbage collector. Yeah. That's when Bishop started to giggle. And Tarek said, look at him there laughing. That clown over there, absolute clown. Bishop claimed that it was Rob and his friends that had attacked him, and he was only carrying the knives in case he needed to defend himself. He told the court, this is a quote, They ran at me. They attacked me. Then as they kept running at me, the knife was catching them while they kept running into it. You wouldn't think people would run at someone who's got a knife. I was just trying to get away. He literally tried to use the same excuse that the character in Chicago the Musical uses when she's like, he ran into my knife. He ran into my knife 10 times. That that's his defense. He's just like, yeah, they just kept running into my knife one after the other. The prosecution argued that the stabbings were out of proportion to anything happening to him. And his reaction was, quote, so over the top, it cannot be regarded as lawful self-defense. Good. And the jury agreed. He was found guilty of murder. Good. The judge, Justice Bean, said to Bishop before sentencing him, quote, I do not think it is proved that you intended to kill Robert Knox. The truth is that you simply couldn't care less whether you killed him or not. When you learned that you had killed Rob, your only response was to say, yeah, sweet. Your lack of regret, let alone remorse, is truly chilling. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. fucking lutely Justice Bean sentenced him to life with a minimum of 20 years before he's eligible for parole, which means he could be out in about four and a half years. No. When it came time for him to receive his sentences for the stabbing of Rob's friends and to hear the victim impact statements of Rob's family, Bishop refused to leave his cell. 
Why no. was that an option? I no. think that should no. be mandatory. You should have to sit there and you should have to fucking listen to everybody who's been affected by what you've done. Agreed. And fucking deal with it, Bishop. I don't bitch. think convicted criminals should be given the option of whether or not they'll hear the family speak. No, I you think, get to hear it. I think it That's needs part of your to punishment. be mandatory. Sorry, I'm talking at the same time you are, but punishment. Bishop also received three other life sentences to be served concurrently for wounding with intent to cause grievous bodily harm. He was not convicted of the injuries to Tom Hopkins for some reason, but he was for the others. So many people turned out for Rob's funeral, including several cast members from Harry Potter, Daniel oh. Radcliffe and Rupert Grint among them. And remember, he was getting that bravery award. Yeah. His family accepted it on his behalf, and they said he would have been so proud. Yeah. Harry Potter premiered in July of 2009, about four months after Bishop was sentenced. And all the cast members wore white bands on their wrist in honor and memory of Rob. That's sweet. Rob's family did not want his death to be in vain, and they've worked tirelessly through the years to educate people on knife crime. They've gone into prisons and spoken to murderers, and they set up the Rob Knox Foundation. Good. Through the foundation, they've been able to fund several initiatives and causes, one of which is a voting system for schools. This is really cool. It's a voting system where students can answer questions anonymously about things they've seen or heard. Like if a student is threatening to bring a knife to school, they can anonymously anonymously report that in this system, which then is used to update police. So the information going into these systems goes directly to the police. They also wanted to carry on Rob's name in a way that would represent him and honor him. So they funded a full bursary or scholarship for a three-year course at D&B Academy of Performing Arts. And they established the Rob Knox London Film Festival. Ooh. The festival is a nonprofit event held annually with all proceeds going toward the Rob Knox Foundation to, quote, help raise awareness of knife and gun crime in the U.K., as well as sponsoring youth programs and talks in schools and prisons throughout the U.K. Wow. And this documentary that was such a great resource when I was researching this episode, again, it's called Knox, the Rob Knox Story, and it won Best Feature Documentary at the 2021 London Independent Film Festival. Wow. As I mentioned earlier, you can find it on Roku.com. So if you go to Roku.com, then go to the Roku channel, then go to BBC Select, Ah. and you can search for it there. Okay. It'll ask for a credit. That's all the steps. It'll ask for a credit card. Oh, my God. Just do the free trial so you can watch the documentary and then cancel before they charge you. Hot take. There you go. Kate is Kate is in it. She has explored this. I did the free trial to watch the documentary. Good That's job. why I'm saying it. There we go. There we go. And that is the story of Rob Knox. Well, I'm pissed. I'm sorry. God damn it, Kate. <laughs> it was, yeah, it's really heartbreaking. The first time, because I watched the documentary several times because I wanted to get quotes and everything. Mm-hmm. And the first time that I watched it, I came downstairs and I just like couldn't speak. And Matt was like, what's going on? I was like, well, I just watched a really heartbreaking documentary and I'm not right. I can't stand it. It's, these people get away with fucking shit and they don't care. And he obviously didn't give a shit. He absolutely did not. He needs to be locked away in solitary confinement for the rest of his life. He should never and be And never have out. the chance to be to get out because he has fucking issues. And he's he's a repeat offender. Yeah. And the two cops, it was a constable and a sergeant that really fucked up the previous case where he was named as a suspect. They have the blood of six people on their hands. Pretty much, yeah. So I hope they sleep well at night. And we hope that you sleep well after listening to this awful story. You can let us know how you thought about it <laughs> on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, or Spotify at... Horrorwood Podcast. Or send us an email at... Horrorwood Podcast at gmail.com. And if you want to be like Liberty, Natalie, Lily, and Christina, you can jump on over to Patreon at... Patreon.com slash Horrorwood Podcast. We're going to have to get Kevin a beer and some food because he's really upset I just, right now. I need my emotion. I need to regulate my emotions, which is why I'm talking like monotone. <laughs> No, I get it. I've been living with the story for a week, and you're just hearing How? it. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's a rough one. Also, come see our live show. Go buy tickets at bit.ly slash horrorwood. 
That'll make us feel better. Okay. Me feel better. 